guys, we're, uh, we're starting this new series called Simple, and um, man, I, I don't know about you and your family, but I'm, I was thinking this week, like, how, how's it going with the, I don't know, 1,000th day of quarantine? How's that, how's that going for you? Um, this week, I, I uh, was, man, I had this thought go through with my head. I was dealing with a teenager in my house. And I thought, I am going to rip this teenager's head off. That was the thought that was going through my mind. And then I heard my five-year-old say, Daddy, please don't rip her head off. And I thought, you know, that wasn't just a thought in my mind. I must have actually said that uh, this week. And, uh, and, you know, poor little five-year-old, please don't, please don't rip her head off, Daddy. Uh, you know, I, man, it's not, that's about how well it's going in my house. And I'm sure your house much better. But uh, there's a, there are a lot of things I'm not feeling great about right now. There are a lot of things uh, about our reality and, uh, and life that just, it's just uneasy and I'm just unsure and I'm in a place where, man, I don't have a clear picture. And I, I was thinking about this. I mean, I, I, thought, I, I thought that we had our minds made up about what we were going to do with school and this next step. And then I had a conversation with my wife, and I realized we didn't have our minds made up, right? We're not, we're, we don't know. We, we're not sure what the best, best uh, next step is. And I mean, uh, I, I'm here this morning in this building, and a few, uh, we have a great crew here, but it's just, uh, it's, just the, it's just band and some tech guys, and I'm realizing this week how much I miss you and how much I miss my friends and uh, the people that I, I love to be around. And it's starting to wear. It's starting to wear. I'm, I'm tired of, um, of not being able to plan. I'm tired of not being able to have a control over my future. I'm tired of every time I put something on the calendar, I put it with a question mark. Because I'm like, it probably won't happen. I mean, I don't know. We can, we can guess that we might get to do this. I'm, 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 uh, it's just tough. I'm, I'm, I'm really tired of saying, I don't know. You know, I'm at that point where no matter what question seems to come at me, I, I say, well, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not feeling great about a lot of things. I'm, I, I'm wondering, you know, I'm, I'm watching my friends uh, in a black community that are, um, you know, that, that have been kind of all summer long, they've been saying, hey, this could be a moment where real change happens and, uh, and we've seen some good movement, some good, uh, good change happen, and people uh, starting to uh, understand each other's perspectives a little bit better and, and starting to care for each other. And yet there's this moment of, of kind of lull and not knowing what really good next steps would be and, and what, what kind of changes are, are real that need to happen. And I'm, I'm not feeling really good about being able to care for my brothers and sisters and, and, and being able to do well in, in that process of listening and, and implementing actual change. I'm not, not feeling, I'm not feeling great about that. And on top of all that, I, I've got just, you know, a family in life. I've got kids and a wife and, uh, you know, we're just trying to understand how to navigate life, how to help middle schoolers understand, uh, navigate middle schooler and high school, under, navigate high school, and, uh, you know, in an in a elementary school, navigate that, and do it online. Man, there's just, there's so much uh, that you could be down about right now. And, uh, and it comes out when I uh, accidentally say I'm going to rip a kid's head off. You know, that's not a good pastoral moment for me. Last week, we were finishing up this, this book of Corinthians, right? We were looking at what Paul said in his letter to the church in Corinth. And as we finished up the, the, the second Corinthians, we got right to the end. It, we, we focused on this part last week. It comes in chapter 12, and he carries it through right to the end, where Paul says, uh, Paul says God's power is made perfect in weakness. And I encourage you, I said, look, even in the midst of a time when you feel like it's weakness, God's at work. Even when you feel like, hey, this, this is a tough time, God's power is being made perfect. And that word perfect is uh, this word completion. God's bringing it to completion. So God's still at work. But as I, uh, as I started to think about this, I go, you know, yeah, uh, we, we talked about this last week. It said that, that 
work that God's doing, it starts in weakness, which means it starts in this place of brokenness. It starts where we admit to ourselves and to each other that uh, we can't pull it all off ourselves. And we're honest about the brokenness that we find ourselves. But then I started thinking, well, okay, if God's going to be at work and God's going to start building, like, what would that look like? Like, practically, really, what would it mean? What, what things would you put in place? If you, if you started in a place of brokenness and you said, you know, this is tough. This has been a, I don't know, a tough summer. It's been a tough few months. It's been a tough lot of months. And, and now it, it just kind of looks like it keeps going. So how would you start in a place like this rather than just being upset, rather than just being down, rather than just saying, look, I don't feel great about a lot of things. How do we invite God to begin working in our lives? And, and what would that look like? What, what are the steps? What are the real practical things? What are the behaviors and the foundations that you could start with? I like to do this illustration. I've done it many times before, even with us here, where, uh, you know, you pour a bunch of sand into a, a jar, and then you get these big rocks you put on top, and they don't fit, right? And you say, look, it just doesn't all fit in the jar. But if you, if you pour the sand out, and you start with the rocks, and then you pour the sand in over the top, it all magically fits. I, I love that one. I didn't bring it out because I've done it before uh, with us. But, but, uh, but the idea behind it is this, like you got to put these big things in place in your life, these big values. you got to set them in place. And, and then the rest of the things start to come together. Well, well, if we wanted to have a flourishing life, even in a time of COVID-19, what would that look like? What would you do? What would you put into place? Where would you put your energy and your focus in a way that it would pay off? You know, here's my kind of, uh, you know, what I've been doing at least. I'm sure you've been different, but here's what I've been doing through this whole thing. When it first started, I was looking back at some of the things we did when we first started off as a church and uh, when we started off in this pandemic and we heard, hey, we're not going to be able to meet uh, this next week. And, and, and this is what it looked like for us. First, there was panic, right? I mean, it's just all right, panic. What? We can't meet? This, oh, what? This thing is coming? Uh, uh, what? Everything is going to change? There was just panic. And then the second thing was there was a scramble. Right? We had to learn quickly technology. We had to go buy technology. We were you know, wrestling with other churches, trying to undercut them to get the you know, cameras in. And not really, but we were trying to get the equipment that we needed, to, you know, and everybody needed it. And there was, there was a, a, a real scramble. And then, and then there, was this, uh, there was creativity that came in that time. Well, how can we make this great? We had sort of some energy and some creativity. And we started figuring out, what can we do as a church? How can we connect with our kids? And how can we connect with youth? And there was sort of uh, some energy and there was this creativity around it. And as, as we did that, we started to make adjustments. We started to say, well, what are the ways that we can do well? And, and families did this too, right? I was talking to a friend of mine who uh, owns a sporting goods store and he, he said, look, man, the workout, the personal workout equipment is selling like, oh, I can't keep it, you know, stocked, right? Everybody's going in there buying some workout equipment. Some of you guys added great family game nights or things like that. You know, you, you, you made some adjustments, you added some things to your life, you, you did some good stuff. Uh, but but oh, after a while, a fatigue started setting in. We started talking about this in our, in our staff team that, uh, you know, we connect with kids on, on Zoom every week and, and they're still doing that, but we got that, you know, the Zoom fatigue, right? And uh, in that kind of general sense of fatigue kind of happened across the board. I think maybe with all of us, there was this sense of fatigue with this, but then, but then there was this ray of hope. Like we thought, oh, Things are going to start opening. And we started planning, and we had this idea of hope. We was like, oh, here's how the rest of the summer is going to go. Here's how the fall is going to go. We're going to plan our way out of this. And so we really started planning and preparing for the future. And it was, well, it was just all dashed, right? Like every plan just ended up being dashed. And the creativity, I noticed, wiping away when the plans aren't working out for my family and the plans aren't working out for our church, and it went from, you know, Zoom fatigue to just plain old fatigue. And there's a sense of tiredness and a sense of longing for some kind of certainty. And, I, 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 and I've kind of entered this phase, I don't know what you'd call it, it's almost like zombie mode. Like, I don't, I'm not even responding to, you know, we'll hear a new thing on the news, something might open, something might, whatever, and I just go, mm-hmm, maybe, 
And my response to everything is, I don't know. My kids say, what are we going to do for school? I don't know. You know, I just, I don't know. We'll see. Or if, I, if somebody does come up with some great answer, or some great solution, I look at them and I go, but of course that'll change tomorrow, right? I mean, you know, it's gonna. Or even the best, when my kids look at me and say, Dad, you know, what, what, what do you think? What do you think? And I just look it back at them and I just blink. That's, that's about where I'm at. I got nothing. I just blink. That's it sort of zombie mode. We're just kind of floating through. And the question is, could you build a flourishing life even when you feel like that? Now, I know most of you don't. You're doing great in the middle of this uh, thing. But I'm just telling you what's going on in the Minter House this morning, okay? We're just talking about the Minter House this morning. Well, the next three weeks, I want us to look at some really clear, really practical things that we can do in a time when it feels like man, there is no security. In a time when it feels like there really isn't a lot of like a sense of a hope for like at least what's next. I mean, we may have a general overall sense of hope, but just for, you know, what we can plan and what we can do in a time when we don't have those things, when that control is taken away, what would it look like if you stripped it all away and you just started simple? So we're going to look at the simple building blocks to a flourishing life that we find in Scripture. Jesus was asked this question many times. It's kind of like, what do I do? How do I, how do I have a great life? How do I have an eternal life? How do I have a flourishing life? And Jesus gives the same answer. And in one place, it's in Jesus' words. Jesus says this back to someone that's asking. Another place, this is uh, Luke chapter 10. Jesus just is asking the questions. And, and actually, the guy uh, who's with him comes up with the answer. And Jesus says, this is the right answer. This is Luke chapter 10. This is verse 25. It says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, and how do you read it? So Jesus is just asking the question. Jesus says, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus is saying, what's the summary? What, What do all the laws add up to? There are these laws that point out to flourishing life. In fact, what we're given in the scripture in the Old Testament, we're given this sense that uh, in in the Old Testament says, look, if you want to have life and live life well, and you want to flourish in life and live to the fullest, you need to obey the law that God gives you. And so uh, Jesus goes back to this law, and he says, what is it? What gives this flourishing life? And so he answers this. This is verse 27. This is the answer. He says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, hey, you've answered this correctly. Do this and you'll live. Now, the rest of the passage is this great, incredible story about breaking down, well, what does that look like? What does it mean? Who is my neighbor? And what is that? Who is actually that person? But, but, but Jesus, I want you to get the core here, just the, the simplicity of this. Jesus has given uh, this answer many times over. What does it look like to really live a flourishing life? And he says, love, love God with everything. Love God first. Love God with everything. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Care about the people around you. If you want to start really simply and you want to put some simple building blocks in place, that's where you start this uh, this summary of the faith that Jesus uh, paints for us. And it actually points back It points back to something that they would have known at the time. The person asking the question, you know, it pointed out that he was an expert in the law. An expert in the law would have known very well Deuteronomy 6. In Deuteronomy 6, there's this passage. It's called the Shema. And and, and we're going to go there a a little bit later. I I won't get to the, the Shema just now. But the Shema is this first start here where it says, love God with everything, with your heart, soul, mind, strength, right? That, that's part of the Shema. Jesus is pointing to something that, that they would have prayed about every day. This is uh, one of the most important passages in, in all of the Jewish world. And they get up every morning and pray this prayer. They go to bed every evening, and, and, and as they do, they pray this prayer. And so Jesus is just pointing back to that. Uh, but, but there's sort of three parts to this that I want you to catch, right? There's kind of three parts to this summary, and that's what we're going to look at for the next three weeks. There's three, three pieces here. The first is to love God. 
So what does that look like? If we're going to go just real simple, real practical, put this in place in our life, the first thing is, what does it mean to love God with everything? And how could you do that? And how could you do that well? Love God, heart, soul, strength, and mind. The second is to love your neighbor, right? And and, and so we're going to talk about that. Well, what does that mean? And how might that uh, make for a flourishing life if we really love our neighbor? And so we'll take a week and we'll just focus on that. What does that mean to love our neighbor? And how do we put it into practice in a time like right now when we kind of feel the way we do, when we have the limitations that we have around us? How can we put it into practice to love our neighbor? But the third is is something that's a little more subtle. You might not catch. And uh, what he says is love your neighbor as you love yourself. See, because there's a piece of that that's like, well, what's going on in me? I got to love the people around me the um, the way I love me. So what does that look like? And these things go together, they flow out, but there, there's, this, there's this sort of connection between me and God, there's what God's doing in my heart and in my soul, and there's this flow that goes out to the people around me, it's three parts. And so for the next three weeks, this series called Simple, we're going to take a look at this. Now, I, I want to turn to this passage, it kind of really lays it out well, it's, it's, it's in the book of, called Micah. Micah's an Old Testament book, it's one of the prophets and, uh, and if you have the Bible app or your phone or you're on the online environment, you can just click on the little Bible thing and go to Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah's a, a really cool book, and we're not going to go through and study the whole book. Um, the, Micah has this ebb and flow. What's going on with Micah? He's, he's speaking to the southern kingdoms when the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were separate. And, and uh, that's, this is old Israel, right? This is long before the time of Jesus. And, uh, and, and he's, uh, the, they're, uh, they're under pressure. And Micah is a prophet. He speaks the voice of God to the people of God. And Micah says, look, you've got to follow God. And, and if you don't, the pressures around you are going to come in and they're going to eventually crush you. Your kingdom will be, you, your, this kingdom of Israel will be wiped out. Micah, though, he speaks in this way that's just really cool. It sort of alters back and forth. Micah goes, hey, you're blowing it and it's going to be utter destruction. It's a mess. And then he goes, but there's hope. And then he goes, man, you're in trouble, but God's going to save you, man. You're, uh, you've got to straighten up, you know, but, but God loves mercy. So I love this book of Micah. It's full of both uh, encouragement to change, right? Some harsh words, but it's also full of this encouragement of hope that God actually does bring change. There's this place where he says, I, I wait for God, my savior. My God will hear me. God, Micah has this confidence that, that God will hear his people. And in one place, he says, but God, you're a God. He, he talks about all the destruction. Then he goes, but you're a God who delights to show mercy. And you will again have compassion on us. And then there's this language. He says, you will tread our sins under your feet. And then when we're gathered for worship, we often do a confession. And sometimes when we get up at the end of the confession, I say, as far, you know, our, our sins are removed from us. As far as the, you know, other side of the sea, that's how far our sins are removed from us. That's an echo of what Micah says. He says, our iniquities are being hurled into the depths of the sea, right? You're God who delights in showing mercy. In, in the book of Micah, we get this promise that, that, that uh, this, this redemption will come through the town of Bethlehem. It's looking forward to Jesus coming into the world and our ability to connect with God. But, but I want us to just to focus in on what's often, uh, this is a pretty famous passage, a little place in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, because it really summarizes this, these core pieces of faith. Look, this is Micah 6, 8. Micah's saying to this group of people, look, you're blowing it, you're messing up, you're in big trouble, it's going down. And then he says, but guys, you know what's right. Here's how he says it, verse uh, 8. He has shown you, O oh people, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So we're going to take up uh, today, in a little bit of time, a few minutes we have left, I want to look just real quickly at what it means to walk humbly with our God. And then the next two weeks, we're going to talk about what's going on in you, that sense of loving mercy, that it goes on in you and it flows to the people around you. And then the last week, we're going to talk about what does it mean to act justly? How do we love 
Um, how do we love our neighbors? Micah says, look, this is simple. Walk humbly with your God. Act justly, love mercy. So what would it look like if we put this kind of a path into our life? And I, I wonder, how's it going, the whole loving God thing, with all your heart, soul, and strength? Or, or if we say it like Micah, how's it going walking humbly with your God? I, I'm going to give you a secret. I, I want you to know just a little thing. Pastors aren't always great and having a great relationship with God. Pastors, uh, sometimes, um, I, mean, I don't want to name any names, but some of us get to where we're just like drifting. And we look at all the things going on around us, and we feel down. Now, I know you don't feel that way, I'm sure, but, but at least for me, guys, I mean, uh, this sermon today, as I look at this passage, this is, this is a reminder to me. How am I going to flourish in this time? What could I do? What does it look like to walk humbly, um, what does it look like to walk humbly with God? I think about the things I tried to put in place in my life during COVID-19. Some have worked uh, okay, others a uh, total failure, but I put a lot of emphasis in a lot of things. But you know what I haven't put emphasis in? My uh, walking humbly with God. Like, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say, well, you know, I, I put a lot of time into exercise. I haven't, but I keep thinking I should, right? I keep thinking about a lot of exercise. So I'm, you know, but, but, but what if, what if, uh, instead of carving out that time, not, not the, maybe not instead of, because exercise is an important, good you know, thing you need to do, but, but you gave as much emphasis, as much time to your relationship with God as you do to exercise. Or, or for you, whatever that is, that place in your life that you put in. What if you actually developed a discipline? Because relationships don't just happen without discipline. And getting to know God and develop a deep relationship with God, this is a, this is a habit. This is a habit that comes with discipline. You know, when we, uh, when we look at the Scripture, we read through the New Testament. We can't do it all this morning, but as we go through the New Testament, you start to see where Jesus spent time with his Father. He did it again and again and again. You'll see often that Jesus will be doing a lot of things with the disciples. He'll be uh, uh, taking care of people in a town, He'll feeding 5,000 people. And, and it seems like he probably crashed later that night, but we see early the next morning, he slipped off to pray. In fact, we see it again and again and again, Jesus slipping off to pray, so that when Jesus, we, we get to see a couple of Jesus' prayers to the Father, and when he talks to the Father, it just makes sense. It's like his normal, you know, it, it's just comfortable language. He's, he's comfortable in his relationship with the Father. It's just like a, a conversation between you and me. Why? Because he's put in the discipline of it. He actually spent time with this. He, he actually uh, carved out places to be with his father. You know, I look at the apostle Paul, and I look at the apostle, and I look at Peter. These guys in the early church, that as they were going through the early church, they seemed to always uh, be able to hear from God. And they could hear God saying, hey, you should go to this next place. You should do this next thing. You know, and I think about that all the time because I'm like, God, why don't you just speak to me really clear, that clearly? Like, hey, we should go do this. I, I should, you know, I should uh, uh, help our church move in this direction. Or, or as a family, we should make this decision. God, why don't you speak uh, that clearly to me? Well, you know, uh, Peter and Paul, they actually built a discipline of speaking to God. And in that discipline of speaking to God, they started to hear God. They, they trained their ear to hear his voice. They developed habits. They built places in their life. They, they carved out time. You know, their relationship with God, this was like the well-worn trails in their life. What are your well-worn trails? What are the things that you're doing every day? I, I, I lose, I drift. But you know, now, now's a great time to begin to build a trail like that in your life. Now, this is something that you can actually do. It's something that you can actually put into place, into practice in your life. You know, there's an old tradition in the church of getting up early in the morning and praying. It's, it's a part of the church. It is a part of uh, the Shema that we're going to take a look at, right? That they would get up and pray this every morning. And I've always heard pastors talk about it, and I, I felt like, man, that sounds like a holier than me, you know? They, they get up real, the earlier you get up, the holier you are as a pastor. And I've always been like, eh, you know, come on, that. I mean, Jesus doesn't want to hear me early in the morning, right? God, God, I am grouchy and grumpy and, you know, 
uh, bleary-eyed. And, you know, God doesn't want to hear me early in the morning. I'm not a, a morning guy. But there is something, there's a reason that this practice starts their day. Because what it does is they begin to get up and speak to God and know who God is. It begins to orient them for their whole day. It begins to focus the direction of where they will spend their time this day. It helps them understand who they are and where their place is in the world. I want you to turn with me. This is Deuteronomy 6. This is the prayer that the Jewish people would pray every morning, and they usually pray it every evening, and then at night as they go to bed, so three times a day. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. And it's uh, such a famous prayer. It has a, a name called the Shema. The word Shema just means here because it starts off with, with here. Okay, so it's not a tricky name here. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then it goes on, it talks about these commandments that I give you today. But this is the, this is the core of this prayer. Love the Lord your God. So focus up. It's God. He, he's, God is one, and God is every, you know, God's, uh, it is all God's. Everything belongs to God. God created all. And they actually orient their day this way. And they remind themselves every morning, uh, everything's God's. I'm going to love God with everything, all the resources I have, heart, soul, strength, mind, everything. I'm going to give that all to God. And so this practice began uh, way back. And when Jesus says, hey, how do you summarize a faith? He actually points back to this early practice of getting up in the morning and giving your day to God. Well, I wonder for you and for me, what would that look like? What would it be like if my habit was to orient my whole day towards God? What would it mean if I started with God so that it began to change my perspective on the decisions I have to make in the day, it began to change my perspective on the worries that I have about the day, it began to change my perspective on the things I'm excited about in the day because I start my day with God. You know, uh, Cammie and I find sometimes our, our relationship is, uh, you know, you know we, have a, this, we have a great marriage, but even in a great marriage, sometimes you find yourself floating you know, kind of the zombie zone like I was talking about before. Like, you know, it, it gets to be hard. And uh, we realize, hey, things are just kind of static and we're not, we're not really progressing and we don't feel really connected. And, you know, uh, when, we, when we have that, when we notice that in our lives, we've learned to listen to each other. I've learned to listen to Camu when she says, hey, I, I've been missing you. Uh, where have you been? And that, that's this little marker, this little reminder. And, uh, and you know what I, I do? I don't turn to her and go, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm just not feeling it right now, right? Like, hey, man, I'm just not feeling it. You know, you're kind of grouch grouchy a little bit, and, you know, I mean, I'm not, no, we don't do that, right? Because we know that if we want to have a good marriage, and we want to have a good relationship, that means we have to carve out time. So don't, when I hear that from Katie, I don't just go, oh, I'm just busy. Can't, we can't, just can't make it all work. Uh, no, the, the relationships actually take this discipline of setting time in the schedule. When things feel a little, uh, when, they're not, when they feel like they're static, they're not moving, or when they feel like they're just kind of floating, we don't just back out and go, well, hey, if there's no friction, then everything must be okay. No, we go, it's time to lean in. If you want to work on a relationship, you have to build habits of connection. If you want a relationship like that to flourish, you've got to put time into it. You know this, you get it. Well, this is what it looks like with your relationship with God. And yet somehow I, I want to say, look, hey, if I'm not feeling God, if God's not doing something for me, I just don't feel really connected with God. I'm not feeling the presence or the power of God in my life, you know, every day. Then, uh, then you know, I don't know. I'm just kind of feeling disconnected with God. That's God's problem. Maybe God would show up miraculously. But actually, actually, if we look at the example of Scripture, what it says is we can we can begin to build these disciplines into our life. So here's what I want you to think about. In the next couple of days, now, if you think, hey, I'm going to do that as soon as school starts back or as soon as our life gets a little bit regular, it'll never happen, okay? So, so here's what I want to encourage you to do. In the next couple of days, I want you to begin to think, what if I, I I'm just gonna, we're going to do a three-part plan 
to uh, flourishing in our lives in this time of COVID. And in part one, I want you to think, what would it look like if I actually started to be a well-worn path in my relationship with God? What would it look like if I actually carved out time for God? What would it look like if I thought, I'm going to lean in to my relationship with God? Guys, there's so many things going on right now. There's so many tough decisions that we have to make. I've got to get kids ready for school. We've got to do it at home, but then also be ready to shift at a moment's notice. If we're going to shift at a moment's notice, we've got to have church up and ready. I mean, I've got so many things that I'm so worried about and so busy about. I do not know how I can carve out extra time for my relationship with God, except that I know this. If I want to flourish, I need to clear off the table and start really simple. And so... What I want you to do is go real dead, just dead simple today. What's one thing that you could do? What's one thing that you could do that you could put into practice? And I want you to try it. I want you to challenge yourself. I want you to do it for one week. Like every day, what does that look like? How could you connect with God? What is your habit? How can you build that habit? There's this this story of... uh, uh, of Paul and Silas. It's Acts 16, and we won't pull it up today, but it's Acts chapter 16. And Paul and Silas, they've been thrown in, into prison. And, 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 and uh, you know, it, it wasn't right how they were thrown into prison. Some guys didn't like that they were, uh, they had healed uh, someone that was making money for them. It's a longer story. I, I would love to get into it. It's, a, it's actually a great story. So go back and read it, Acts chapter 16. But, but it really wasn't right. And they were Roman citizens, and they were thrown into prison without even a trial or anything else. And as they're in prison, uh, they're sitting there in the middle of the night. And you you might remember this story, but I I think about it often. If I was sitting in prison, I've been thrown in prison uh, without a trial, unright, you know, it wasn't a right thing that had happened to them. They weren't in the wrong. What would you be thinking? If I was sitting in prison late at night, I would be plotting my lawsuit, right? I'd be getting, I'd be calling every lawyer that I know. Hey, uh, hey, what what do I need to do? How do I need to set this up? If I was thrown in prison and I was sitting there in the middle of the night, I'd be complaining. If I was thrown in prison, I was sitting there in the middle of the night, I would be down. I would be depressed. But Paul and Silas, it says, they were singing hymns and praying to God. And as they do, something miraculous happens. There's this earthquake. Man, it's this incredible story. But they don't, they don't, they're, they're, they're sort of like freed, but they don't run off. They, they stay with the prison guard, and prison guard becomes a follower of Christ. And I mean, it's just, it's a great story. Go back, read the story. But I, I love this picture of Paul and Silas. They're sitting there, and, they're, and, and they're, they're, what they think to do in the midst of a tough time is to turn to God and sing hymns and pray. Why don't I think to do that? Because it's not the habits that I've built into my life. It's just the habits that Paul and Silas have put into place in their life. What could that look like for you? For some of you, it just needs, you need to get up a little bit early, pull up your calendar, look at your calendar, and begin to give God everything on that calendar, one thing at a time. You need to get up a little bit early and just lay hands on your cell phone that has all the emails that are coming at you. And just pray, you know, pray the devil out of that thing. I don't know. Uh, You you need to just give it to Jesus. For some of you, you need to spend time reading scripture. You need to pick a book of scripture and read it. You need to find somebody to do this with you. Man, I'll do it with you. You know, we do things better. We can build a habit in our life if we get somebody to do it with us. So find somebody that's willing to do this. Read scripture. Read it together. Get up every day and just read it. Look, if you can't read uh, a whole chapter a day, that's fine. Read one verse. Some of you just need to start. You need to take a step. Others of you need to build a habit that can last for longer. I have some friends that their alarm goes off every day at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m. That's because of a, a Luke chapter 10, verse 2. It says, pray to the Lord of the harvest for the workers are few. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. And they're praying that God would raise up leaders to care for the people in the country. But they've done it by just putting these two alarms on. And you're, I mean, it's a little bit awkward, like you're hanging out with them and then all of a sudden their alarm goes off and they're like, hey, just I'll be back in just a minute. And they just kind of go find a little place and they pray just for like two minutes. It's not like a big deal. Um, you know, pick your verse, put that into your phone. Just make that a habit this time, something that draws you to God. Some of you need to get a journal and begin to write and you need to talk to God and you do that well by writing. Others of you need to go deep. Some of you need to fast. You know, this is a, this is a discipline, this practice in scripture where you give up, you give up food because you've got big things weighing on you and, and you're so stressed out and you're going, I don't know how we're going to do the next thing. I don't know where it's going to come from. 
And you know what they did in biblical times and that? They actually fasted. They, they didn't eat. It's like a day. Maybe more. We, we had one place where Jesus said he was fasting for 40 days, right? They didn't eat. But it wasn't like a hunger strike. It was a calling out to God. I'm not going to eat today. Instead, I'm going to be reminded, God, that it's only you that provide. It's only you that gives me my next breath and my next meal. And, and no matter how hard I try and I plan, I can't make it happen. So, God, I'm going to fast today, and I'm going to call out to you, and I'm going to ask for you to speak to me. And some of you have never tried that, and it sounds really crazy, and I want you just to try it. Just do it. Give up one meal. Do it maybe one meal a week. And instead of having that meal, you go find a little place and just talk to God one day a week, one lunch. Some of you, some of you need to fast, not because, uh, not because you need to add something to your life, but because your life is so stressful, you need to clear things out of the way and start at zero. What would it look like for you? Some of you, some of you just need to get in a room and turn the music up and sing. You know, turn your thing up and, and uh, you know, find, we can help you find a, a good uh, Spotify playlist that's some uh, music that points us to God. Some of you need to do this. Others of you need to take that walk that you do every day and, uh, and instead of just going through the list of all the things that aren't done, you need to take that walk and turn it into a time of prayer. I don't know, I don't know what it looks like for you. I, I, I do know that there are places that, uh, uh, that, that help me get into a mode where I'm connecting with God. And sometimes for me, I sit and I have an office over here in our youth center, so off the side of it. And some days when nobody's there, I just go over to the youth center. There's, there's these nice risers there. It's just a great place just to kneel down. And uh, it only happens when I'm, when I'm just crying out to God. And so I go over there and I can, I can be pretty loud in, in, in my little prayer place because nobody's in the room and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking into the floor basically. I just get down on my knees and I just call, I just cry out. I cry out for our church. I cry out for you. I cry out for our family. This is, uh, this is the start. I've got to have this place where I'm able to talk to God. And sometimes I just sit there and listen. Some of you need to find a little place on the floor. You just need to lie down on the floor and talk to God. I don't know, I don't know what that looks like. But I do know that if you want to start to flourish, you need to clear things out of the way. You need to put these simple elements in place. And as you do, God will meet you there. 